Yeah. Meanwhile, we can start okay. with the third topic. Yes. I'm not able to share my screen at all. Try now. One second, sir. Am I visible? Yes. Am I visible? Yes, yes, you are visible. Yeah. Sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good evening. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, I would like to share uh, the experiences uh, which we usually face as a faculty in a medical college while we teach our uh, postgraduates. And uh, the topic which has been alerted to me is the difficulties a postgraduate faces while delivering the nucleus um, from the eye. See, it has to be categorized into two categories. One is delivering the nucleus from the capsular bag into the anterior chamber. That is one uh, part of the nucleus management. Second is delivering the nucleus from the anterior chamber outside. These are, these are the two uh, points on the top. These are under two headings I would like to discuss. The first one is delivering the nucleus from the anterior chamber into the anterior chamber from the capsular bag. Most of the time, what we usually notice is we, whenever we teach a postgraduate, what we usually do, we, we tell them to do particular steps actually. And uh, once they complete that particular step and they become proficient, they proceed on to the next step. That is how it is. And uh, one of the beginning steps which we usually tell them to do is the capsular procedure, a canopular capsulotomy or a capsular excess. And whenever they try to do a capsular excess, most of the time they try to do it, we, we teach them to do it through the side port itself. And most of the time, the capsular excess which they fashion out, we usually will be a small capsular excess. And sometimes it will be as small as four to four millimeter to 4.5 millimeter. For a beginner, it is always difficult to maneuver the nucleus through a small capsular excess. This is one of the commonest uh, uh, thing a postgraduate does in the initial part of his learning curve. The second thing is that most of them will not be able to complete the capsular procedure, the capsular excess. Sometimes part of it will be a capsular excess and part of it will be a canopular capsulotomy. And sometimes uh, if it is a very mature cataract or if there are some capsular fibrosis, they, they will convert it into a canopular capsulotomy. And in such a situation, the capsular tax will always be difficult and they will come in way of the nucleus delivery from the anterior capsule, from the capsular sac into the anterior chamber. The third, third important thing is most of them, they don't do a proper IDO procedure. Sometimes the IDO procedure might not be complete. See, there are particular signs which one has to notice whenever they to just tell that the IDO procedure is proper. That is, your um, IDO dissection is proper. That is what we usually teach them. One is, if the nucleus or if the cataract is immature, you can see the fluid wave, which usually goes beneath the nucleus. Second is, there will be a slight shallowing of the anterior chamber. And third is, the nucleus will rotate. Sometimes what will happen, because of improper hydro procedures, and um, the postgraduate will try to attempt the nucleus when the hydro procedure is incomplete. In such a situation, what usually happens is, we can get a zonal adhesions because of uh, improper uh, separation of the cortical fibers from the capsular sac. And we are, occasionally we see even um, ICC being occurring also because of inadequate IDO procedures. So one of the most important thing is before they try to attempt any cap nuclear management, they have to learn IDO procedure properly. Okay, next. Third is with difficulty, they will just bring out one pole of the nucleus into the anterior chamber. And sometimes they might find it very difficult to bring out the second pole of the nucleus outside the capsular bag. And they try to maneuver it and most of the time they, it keeps on rotating inside the capsular bag. In such a situation, they should also, uh, it, should, it is always better to uh, bring it into their uh, mind that we can use an in invisible hand, a viscoelastic. That usually I would like to call it as an invisible hand. You can just push the iris uh, backwards using a viscoelastic 
and we using a single single uh, sinski hook itself we can just uh, bring out the second pole of the nucleus outside the capsular bag and this is one of the mistake what they do once they bring one pole of the nucleus it is always better they insert the inject more viscoelastic and then they try to bring out the nucleus from the capsular bag and uh, another important thing what we usually notice is while they try to manner the nucleus most of the time there will be an iris uh, touch and intramyosis intraoperative meiosis or the pupil becoming smaller is one of the most important um, uh, factor which will always uh, which will always make them difficult to bring the nucleus into the anterior chamber and uh, most importantly what will happen because this uh, during the learning process that this happened to me also most of the time what happens whatever nucle viscoelastic you inject inside the anterior chamber sometimes it can be lost when you try to maneuver each time you put an instrument a little bit of viscoelastic can come out especially the second instrument and um, usually it results in loss of the anterior chamber and the shallow the anterior chamber becomes very shallow, shallow also these are the few things um, which a postgraduates usually find uh, difficult while bringing the nucleus into the anterior chamber from the capsular bag next is once with difficulty if the nucleus is delivered into the anterior chamber there are a couple of uh, things which um, i have noticed uh, during the course of our uh, uh, training period here while teaching the postgraduates lot of things are there see um, can this uh, nucleus delivery is one step of uh, cataract surgery that what everybody has to understand each and every step of cataract surgery is very important suppose if the scleral tunnel is not properly fashioned or your capsular excess is not done properly and all these things will lead to difficulties later on for the subsequent uh, steps and uh, 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 professor t k ramesh used to tell us uh, if one step is wrong it will produce a complication cascade just like you get a complement uh, the cascade and all those things in the inflammatory process it is a complication cascade that is what he had uh, taught us that usually occurs see most importantly supposing if the scleral tunnel is not properly fashioned what usually happens some of the nucleus is maneuvered into the anterior chamber while bringing it out from the anterior chamber what will happen the iris will start coming out through the wound and they will be trying to push the instruments to one is not one instrument it will be two instruments and every time the iris comes out and the instrument goes in it will traumatize the iris there will be intraoperative meiosis there will be chafing of the iris sometimes there might be iridodialysis also and uh, while delivering the nucleus outside from the anterior chamber the nucleus can get stuck, can get stuck at the lip of the tunnel also <laughs> these are all the problems usually we face if the tunnel is not done properly and the nucleus is and the nucleus delivery is attempted uh, in such a situation next is the size of the tunnel so most of the time they make a very good uh, tunnel and usually the size of the tunnel will be very small it it is always important to note that uh, uh, that paul cox theory and all those things are there it is always important to note that whatever be the size of the incision supposing if there is an incision of around 3.5 mm or 2.8 mm like what you do for a phaco that is more of a refractive incision but any incision you make from 3.5 mm to say 6.5 to 7 mm there is no significant change in the astigmatism by just uh, making it 4.5 to 5.5 5.5 to 6.5 there is not much of a change of a uh, change in the astigmatism so basically you should be very liberal during the initial learning process to make a very good um, uh, sized tunnel that is most one of the important uh, thing what usually most of the post graduates do they do a very small tunnel sometimes it will be a 5 to 5.5 mm tunnel and um, when when they they do all the other maneuvers properly and they bring the nucleus into the anterior chamber and supposing the nucleus is of grade 2 and grade 3 then they will find it difficult to bring out the nucleus into the uh, nucleus outside in such a situation what usually happens is they might uh, try to maneuver two three times and that is very traumatic to the corneal endothelium also okay next is uh, every time they try to do this what will happen there will be a little bit of uh, viscoelastic loss from the anterior chamber and sometimes the chamber collapses and the usually the instrument uh, there will be an instrument touch commonly the sinski hook can touch the corneal endothelium and um, 
every manner every time you notice the anterior chamber collapsing or if you feel the anterior chamber is shallowing you should just stop in between and you should inject viscoelastic that is one important thing which everybody has to do uh, now coming to the main technique i think phaco sandwich is one of the most commonly taught uh, uh, mode of uh, nucleus delivery this has been popularized by peter kansas and uh, this is a wonderful technique for an incision between almost uh, 4.5 to 7 mm this is a very beautiful technique any type of nucleus you can just uh, bring out atraumatically from the eye and what are all the problems we usually notice for a big for, for a beginner when they try to bring out a nucleus uh, using this particular phaco sandwich technique phaco sandwich technique involves introduction of two different instruments into the eye the configuration of the two the configuration of the two instruments are totally different your vectors which you are going to put beneath the nucleus is more of a curved instrument a penetrated curved instrument there is another instrument which you are going to place above the nucleus sometimes can be like in the form of a curve and usually it will be in the form of a straight line and there will be a small hook at the center usually commonly what we use is a sinski hook earlier uh, there were bisectors available most of the time what we usually commonly use is this sinski hook um, uh, what usually happens is while doing a fico sandwich technique uh, the nucleus is there in the anterior chamber viscoelastic is filled above and below the nucleus once they place the vectus beneath the uh, nucleus what usually happens is sometimes they just try to lift it up and usually the space between the endothelium and the uh, nucleus will reduce and such a situation they should try to they should try to um, uh, stop then and inject more visco before inter introducing the other instrument this is one thing which i have noticed and um, well, if they do that then it is very easy and second thing is the proper positioning of the instrument is very important either we can keep it criss cross like how dr msr has demonstrated or sometimes we can keep it parallel also it depends upon uh, uh, your uh, convenience but i think the criss cross method is one of the safest method and it is uh, much easier supposing if it slips or something like that or if the nucleus is very small and if you try to uh, bisect and uh, if the it is better if the instruments are placed in the criss cross position because the another, another instrument cannot slip and go posteriorly if you keep the two instruments parallelly sometimes it can slip that uh, thing is there so this is another thing which we commonly see and uh, during the uh, maneuvering of the nucleus from the anterior chamber most of the time what we usually see is um, sometimes it cannot it doesn't come out with a, in a single at one they will they'll try multiple times to uh, bring it inside and uh, take it in, taking it outside from the eye two three attempts they will make and that will be very traumatic sometimes also most of the time uh, we can usually make out that the upper part of the endothelium of the cornea near the incision is usually uh, showing most uh, the most of the time more stray in the first post operative period and supposing if uh, the instruments are not properly introduced or um, Uh, while doing this hydration in there and sometimes we have we see occasionally a dismal detachment also these are some of the common th the things we usually see while delivering the nucleus from the anterior chamber and uh, this intraoperative meiosis is another problem because of repeated maneuvering in the anterior chamber the pupil usually tends to constrict basically it is always better to put an nsaid preoperatively to keep the pupil well dilated and intraoperatively to use adrenaline also but even then sometimes we see many cases the intraoperative meiosis and sometimes what will happen if there is a meiosis pupil is small and you have blindly placed on instrument if it the cataract is a relatively mature cataract and you have just placed the vectus behind the nucleus and part of it can get uh, uh, caught between the uh, instrument and the inferior pole of the nucleus and while you try to bring out the nucleus inferior aortic dialysis is one of the common uh, complication of uh, i think this is one of the unique complication of sics also yeah. and basically because the iris is caught during uh, nucleus delivery these are the few points which i have noticed uh, uh, during the course of my teaching at minto hospital while uh, teaching the postgraduates um, the difficulties the postgraduates faces while delivering the nucleus from the eyeball 
I just uh, try to play a small video, which my just postgraduate just sent uh, just a couple of uh, minutes back. I just uh, try to play that video. One second. Is the video visible? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> this was sent by one of my postgraduate. Just try to. The nucleus is in the anterior chamber. Uh, this is one thing what we commonly usually see. Uh, the instrument is not totally introduced inside the eyeball. That is your rectus. Sometimes it is partly introduced behind the nucleus, and uh, sometimes the superior instrument, your Sinsky hook, is also not uh, totally introduced. And uh, in this case, of course, the nucleus came out easily. Supposing if it is a much harder nucleus, a grade two, grade three nucleus, it will be very difficult. Just to watch. Huh? Viscoelastic is being injected, and uh, this is one step uh, where uh, the beginner always try to do all the steps in a hesitant manner. They will be very confident while doing the tunnel and rexis. This is one step they feel they will be very hesitant. You can just see the vector is going behind the nucleus. And the lattice is tilted upwards. The nucleus just is coming out, coming up, and sometimes there must be an endothelial touch also. So the instrument is almost three fourth covering the posterior part of the this thing nucleus, and the upper instrument is not totally inserted, and the nucleus is. Being manured outside the anterior chamber. Since the nucleus was, was very soft and grade one to two, it came out easily. Supposing if it were to be a much harder nucleus, usually what will happen? It will just uh, stay there only. So you might have to repeatedly do it. That will be very traumatic to the eye and the corneal endothelium. Another video she has sent. Even I have not seen that. I'll just uh, try to play it. And uh, we, yeah, nucleus has been delivered well. And our training program has been affected at our hospital because ours has become a total uh, COVID center. And um, most of the postgraduates who went to SSS, they have um, uh, finished their graduation, their degrees, and they uh, they have gone. The present batch who are in the final year, they are. Um, not getting proper training in the sense because almost the surgeries were stopped for six months and only since the past July onwards, um, surgeries have started at our place. So kindly enlarge, enlarge sir. Enlarge one, sec one second, one second, one second. Yeah. You can phone list attend Yeah, yeah. This has come out easily. So that is one of the advantage of having a very large tunnel. It is better you make an incision of around 6 to 6.5 to 7 millimeter and life will be very easy. And uh, usually the amount of astigmatism, the quantum of astigmatism which you get in a small incision cataract, it depends, is directly proportional to the length of the incision, but it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the limbus. So the more posterior you go, um, it will be more difficult for you to do the nuclear uh, manuals also. That is what you have to understand. So the amount of astigmatism which you are going to reduce by making your incision very posterior is very less. Mainly it is the length of the incision which is very important. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yeah. That was a nice talk, sir. Yeah, thank you. You took me through the whole post graduation <laughs> all over again. Yeah, thank you, thank you. How so many mistakes we used to do in the learning phase. Can we? Yeah. Any questions? Anybody?
Dr. Nagraj, you should stop sharing your screen, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I think, sir, Ravindra sir and myself um, undergone this uh, learning curve, I think. Uh, it was a very long learning curve, I think, sir, during our uh, period. I think okay. postgraduates are now lucky because their learning curve is very short and very traumatic also. I think uh, I have, uh, if nobody is commenting, I would like to comment a few on uh, the wonderful videos you showed postgraduates. Uh, number one, I think we discussed last time, the, uh, the postgraduates are more worried about post capsule rather than endothelium. Uh, as he was putting biovac test, he was pushing, as you can see the video again, if you wish to, he's pushing the nucleus down and down. That is, it is hitting the convexity of, if, uh, uh, if, if that is the uh, thing, with the biovac, he's, he's hitting the convexity, he should go down and come like that. He should go down and the fill, fill the entire back and front of the nucleus with viscoelastic. The direction of vector's movement should be down, along with like a spoon picking up gulab jamun, you know, like if you cannot push it down, you go down and uh, see that the nucleus does not move down. See, the, the configuration of antechamber, it's got the, the largest con width in the center. As you go to the periphery, it becomes narrow. The nucleus should remain in the center of the antechamber. If you push it down, you will have endothelial damage. And uh, this is the one point I would like to say. And uh, the virovectus is visible throughout. And uh, when you're actually taking it out, inspect that some portion of virovectus has gone under the iris, then that's the time when you uh, create a dialysis. So before you try to push the nucleus out, inspect the lower end of the virovectus. So it should be uh, not hidden behind the iris. It should continuously, it should be fully visible. The second uh, one was uh, the virovectus is very thick. It occupied space. And uh, sedations have no role actually. When you pick it up, that's what we were discussing in the last time. Pick up one without sedation, very narrow uh, metal, so that it, it, it occupies less space. So these are the two points I would like to mention on uh, these two uh, videos. And uh, they're marvelous. I think this is how uh, they should come out with videos so that we can look at them. And many times they'll be pressing on the posterior lip also, so that has to be avoided. What of visco leaks out. Yeah, when you press on the, when you want to remove something from the anterior chamber, pressurize the posterior limb so that there is a slight amount of increase in the intraocular pressure, which again assists for the items to come out. Like when you have pieces of, uh, you know, nucleus, epinucleus inside, the trick to take out contents of the anterior chamber out of the anterior chamber is to by pressing, pressing the floor of it. If you want to retain something in the eye, if you do not want it to come up, then you angulate the instrument in line with the curvature of the uh, cornea so that the uh, tunnel is not fixed and lift it up a little bit so that there's no pressure on the back of it. So that's why you fill the chamber by keeping the channel parallel to the tunnel and do not press the floor. So you keep filling the chamber with whatever visco or whatever it is. If you want to drain something, keep it parallel to the iris and push it down so that the contents of the eye comes up. With the, these two you remember, it will be very easy. Many of the steps will become very easy if you understand this philosophy. As Dr. Preeti said, if you press it down, content will come out, sir. Dr. Another, uh, one more thing, if I can interrupt. Another thing what uh, uh, I think um, during the training period, what you usually do, these postgraduates do is they do all the procedures manuals under low magnification. And uh, basically, uh, what I recommend is basically when you do this uh, capsulotomy and uh, delivering the nucleus into the anterior chamber, a good magnification has to be there. If, they, if these manuals are done under low magnification, what usually happens is uh, they will not be able to see the capsular edge. Invariably, you might tend to traumatize these zonules and all those things. And uh, that is what usually I teach them. But most of the time, when I come there, they'll try to make it uh, high magnification. When I'm not there, they'll do under low magnification. Of course, low magnification, it is very easy for them because they'll be seeing their hands and instruments and all those things. These are few things. Uh, I think over a period of time, each and every person will develop their own uh, uh, manuals and technique and they'll um, come out well.
think some simple tips will have to bring it out to them. That's a very good point. But the other thing is uh, what uh, you know. Uh, I observe already lower the magnification, the depth of field will be higher. They'll be able to see the front of the cornea, back of the cornea, you know, up to the iris and little beyond the iris when you have low magnification. See, the depth of uh, field of depth of focus comes down higher is the magnification. So if you have high magnification, if your foot switch has to be on the uh, my, uh, focusing pedal all the time, you'll have to keep moving up and down, up and down. See, like when I want to load my lens into the, uh, the thing, I'll, instead of focusing it again up and down, I load the magnification. So everything will be visible even five millimeters above the cornea. So uh, that's the trick I use. Whenever I want to load, see something beyond the range, I lower the magnification, I'll start seeing it. So if you uh, alter the, uh, uh, you know, the focusing, then again, you'll have to go back to the correct focusing. Here, zoom in and zoom out uh, will be a good uh, way to proceed when you want to increase the depth of field. Anybody who is attending would like to comment? Anybody I can unmute it. Heart attack. Heart attack. When they engage the... Tell me, doctor. Tell me, doctor. Can you repeat? Yes. We can't hear the vectors below the iris. We can't hear you, sir. Can you repeat? Can you please repeat? No. Thank you, sir. I think Dr. Mandikarjan is. Can we take the questions later, sir? Uh, can we... uh, sure. Can we go to the next topic? No, actually, Dr. Dev, uh, he's having internet issues like this, so he may not be able to present today. So we'll be postponing his presentation the next week. Okay. Uh, so we can continue the discussion. Sure. Yeah, and uh, one more like uh, the common mistake uh, which I have seen in residents while doing the cases. As Nagraj sir said, uh, the one problem is the zoom in and zoom out. Usually they'll be doing with 0.4x or 0.6x. That is one thing. And the other thing is like they will always be concentrating at the tip of the instrument and they'll totally forget what's happening at the wound. So they'll put undue pressure at the wound, especially while during lens delivery and all. So obviously like uh, sometimes the entire bag will also come out because of the undue pressure and even there'll be a lot of uh, vitreous disturbance. And we should always try to teach them uh, not to not to be like Arjuna to see only that uh, pointed high and to make sure that you're seeing the entire operating field especially the wound, uh, uh, then I think it would be very easy for them. That's one thing. Uh, since we have time, Dr. Nagraj, can you just play back the uh, video again, the first video? One, one second. I just have to go to share screen. Shall I play, play from the beginning? Yeah, yeah, from the beginning, first, yeah. Yeah. Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Uh, you yeah. can, uh, fine, it's fine. Let it play. Uh, sir, uh, Ravinder, sir, you can just comment. Dr. Nagaraj, can you move the uh, play bar, bar which is coming to the top right hand side so it can it is away from the uh, visual field? The yeah. play. Can play you pass here. now? Can you pass now? Can you pass? Yeah. Can you play? Play it again. Play it again. Dr. Nagaraj, can you replay it? One second, sir. Yeah. See, what he is doing is the uh, wire vectors when he is taking inside, he has uh, gone behind the, the uh, leading pole of the nucleus. After that, he keeps the plane of the wire vectors up, you know, the tip of it is going up rather than down. He is not following the curve of the back of the nucleus. So uh, then, as you can, as Nagaraj plays, you can see the entire nucleus moving away from the tunnel side. He is doing uh, uh, superiorly. The eye is turned down. If you are doing superiorly, eye needs to turn down. It's not 
to remember this throughout the surgery i has to be looking at the microscope at no point of time you should turn the eye in any particular direction if you want to be very comfortable your vision is very good your view is very good and uh, the the parallax are avoided all these are possible when the plane of the iris is parallel to the plane of the objective of the microscope and also you'll record it much much better so now the entire eye is looking down because the surgeon is sitting on the superior side of the uh, head can you play dr nagraj so we'll just yes. see i think you lost that uh, bar if i'm right it must be somewhere hidden down you can close it and come back if it's possible this bar no sir so it's not playing sir so just close the video and we'll okay. play it again Is it visible now? Hello. Uh, no, your share screen is not started yet. Oh my God! One second. No. Yes. You might zoom it up. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Let it play. Let it play. Yeah. Now he is pushing. See, entire nucleus is going down. and the whole eye is also going down so you is not finding the plane between the posterior capsule uh, of is not posterior capsule there is a lot of iris. cortex there posterior cortex and the nucleus let him run let him play let it run now he is injecting visco again and moving it on either side so this movement to the side should be avoided always inject between the endothelium and the cortex don't move it left and right So now he's again moving to the left side. That means the left side endothelium is getting pressed with the uh, with the nucleus. So nucleus should always remain in the center, and ultimately it has to come out of the eye. So now he'll probably put the wire vectors once more. As you can see, the plane uh, wire vectors it is not configuring to the back of the nucleus, and it's a very thick serrated nucleus which occupies a lot of space. So he's again trying to push the nucleus down, nucleus down. and it's almost impinging on the lower uh, the distant uh, angle uh so uh ah now he has got it and he is pressing it against the endothelium now this is a step this is uh, you know the case ago i have told instead of sinski hook which has got a hook and space you can use a cannula which keeps injecting this one now we straightened it and uh, as dr nagraj mentioned he is only maneuvering the leading uh, pole and uh, fortunately he could get it because it's a soft nucleus if it were to be hard then it would have been he would have had problem so this is only understanding the geometry of the anterior chamber which is uh, like that which is like that uh, plano convex and understanding the geometry of the nucleus which is biconvex nucleus is more curvaceous posteriorly than anteriorly it's got steeper curve backwards when compared to the front so you'll have to really go backwards parallel to the uh, nucleus to reach the lower pole and see that the nucleus remains in center of the uh, anterior chamber throughout and um, these these are tiny tips that i can give length of the scleral tunnel also is too long probably that is making the maneuvering even more difficult in this case tell me again doctor the length of the scleral tunnel in this case was a little longer probably that was making it difficult to maneuver the vector longer tunnels are not bad especially depending upon the uh, amount of astigmatism you have but only thing is the whole uh, tunnel is directed upwards actually but then you let the whole tunnel goes down that distorts the cornea so a shorter tunnel you will be able to say if it's a long corneal tunnel the entire tunnel has to be tilted down so that creates folds on the endothelium and there will be some amount of some some loss of endothelial cells will be there if it's a very long tunnel extending onto the corneal side so it has to be a balance between length of the tunnel and how much of astigmatism we want to get at the end of it longer the tunnel lesser is the astigmatism so if you have uh, if you are working on a steep axis like for that matter against the old cornea then you can afford to have if you are operating temporarily you can afford to have short tunnels
So now uh, what I'll do is I'll be in, instead of uh, the uh, the French cook, I'll be injecting visco and then taking it out along the way. He's got a very large tunnel with a small size nucleus, though it's hard. So it was very easy for him to be very lucky to uh, remove it without any any difficulty. Uh, Dr. Deepak, you have uh, uh, your observations can you share? Uh, I think yeah, what I would want to say that the, the surgeon was very reluctant to introduce his uh, dialer or Sinsky hook. He was trying to manipulate majority of things only with the vectors. So it was a, he, the, the dialer didn't even go one third of the inside of the eye actually. So uh, he is just trying to, is lucky that only the vectors could get him out. It's something like your irrigating vectors technique where he just pulled it out. The dialer did not play any role at all in this situation. So probably is very skeptical. My suggestion always would be you have to introduce a dialer, dialer and push the nucleus down with the dialer so that it is squeezed in between the Sinsky hook and the vectus. Then you pull it out. So that is the way to do a phaco sandwich technique that is going to prevent trauma to your endothelium. But here the nucleus was pushing, pushed to the endothelium. There is no space for him to place the dialer at all. So the dialer did not play any role at all in this case. So maybe he was a little bit skeptical. So it does happen in the learning curve. And very importantly, you told sir that you know the biggest space is the center of the antechamber. So it had pushed to the inferior antechamber where we don't have enough space. And it was lucky that you know the contract was stop, uh, soft here. Uh, Dr. Nagaraj, you have facilities for endothelial count in, in your hospital? Yes, sir. Do you do the post postgraduates do it as a routine? So that's a very yeah. good feedback. Yeah. Uh, you know, every case pre-op and post-op, uh, you should do endothelial count, especially when you're learning, when you're mm -hmm. changing your technique. You know, like so many times I do uh, change a technique and immediately I'm warned by my drop in endothelial count. So mm -hmm. ideally, endothelial count, if it's 2,200 cells, you should end up with 2,100 cells, not 1,800 cells. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, corneal thickness is a very bad parameter. Some people monitor how much damage you have said. I've, I know 600 cells can come down. Two weeks time, corneal thickness can be 515, was pre-op, post-op will be 514. So there is no change in the corneal thickness in spite of a huge drop in the endothelial uh, count. This is a uh, serial thing we have observed. The only thing is you need to observe the endothelial count when you are changing technique or when you are, you know, it, it gives a very good feedback. And the other thing is, uh, you know, it's an ideal, there is a, some calculation depending upon how much a stride keratopathy you watch, you see it on the day one, you can roughly calculate, there's a formula, I've forgotten, I can't remember right now, there's a formula if this much is right, this much is endothelial loss. I think if it, one of the postgraduates, you can give a study as to if you have an, a specular, you can, they can analyze what is the first day postoperative picture versus the amount of endothelial loss that occurs say in about a month's time. At the end of one month. So that will be a very good study to understand for the teaching for the postgraduates to analyze their own techniques. Uh, do you have any time to discuss till more? Or is it... That uh, everybody else has to say. It's 10 17, 17 now. We started about 10, 8, 6 minutes, 7 minutes late. You can, you can discuss, doctor. Uh, usually, the beginners. In the sandwich technique, sometimes they engage in vectis, uh, especially in heart cataract, below the iris, and they end up with uh, aridodialysis because nothing is seen behind the nucleus, especially heart cataract and uh, white cataracts. Wow. And I usually tell them when you withdraw very slowly and also look at the movement of the iris when you're looking. So there is a movement of iris that might. And, uh, that means you might have caught the iris also and stop it, re-engage it and uh, that's uh, that's one way of avoiding uh, aerodialysis. Is there any methods or any methods to identify this engaging the iris by the delivering the nucleus, especially in heart cataracts? Yeah, this question came up last time I think Dr. Sundaram Shetty was supposed to answer this. Is Dr. Shetty, Shetty would you like to answer Dr. Shetty? Sundara. You can unmute. 
Hello. Ah, we can hear you. Well, uh, the, the, the tiered of practice, that's the idea. You know, we do not want a tapering and um, uh, vectis. So it need not go beyond, just beyond midpoint. You need not go to the other end of the entire chamber. So the ensure that the vectis doesn't go right up to the, uh, you know, angle of the opposite end. So just beyond the center, that is where the, the widest part of the vectis is, and also the center of the nucleus is, and uh, that is where you put the dialer also on top of the nucleus. These three things should be in line. And uh, I don't know, I haven't uh, seen a nucleus wherein you can't actually at least, you know, vaguely see the rectus. Even in uh, cataract Niagara, only two days back I was showing uh, to somebody, even there also you can see the faint, uh, you know, the shape of the vectis which is passing under the nucleus. And uh, if the pupil has constricted and become small, uh, pupil has become small, again, there is an advantage because pupil is small, very unlikely to pass it through the pupil and uh, catch the iris. But that is the time you catch it basically. When pupil is well dilated, it's very difficult to catch the iris. And uh, the, I always tell my fellows that you don't lose the feel of the nucleus, meaning you go along the posterior surface rather than, you know, independent of the posterior surface. The vectis should follow the posterior surface. And uh, in that way, you are close to the uh, nucleus. There is hardly any gap between the nucleus and the vectis. And uh, the, you have to remember the shape of the vectis so that it should there should not be any gap at the tip of the vectis uh, between nucleus and the vectis so it should turn as the as it re reaches the center of the posterior surface of the nucleus and it should still continue to hug the nucleus so that you know there is no chance for anything else to come another actually another area of aerodilysis is as you are entering to go uh, the anterior chamber and trying to take the vectis under the nucleus. Sometimes the iris can be caught there. As you are starting this um, process of passing the vectis under the uh, nucleus. So in such cases, you can keep the dialer uh, and, um, over the iris and then pass the vectis over the dialer. Once you are past the iris, then you can remove the dialer. And uh, I was watching this video where uh, Nagaraj was showing of the students, the first one where he was, he was jamming the nucleus. Uh, ideally, what should have been uh, the procedure, the dialer should have gone in first and lifted the edge of the nucleus and freed it from the inner lip. And then he would have easily passed the vectis under the nucleus. Actually, part of the nucleus was still under the uh, inferior lip of the inner opening, and he was trying to pass the vectis. That's how it was not passing under the nucleus. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sometimes what happens, so if there is a section is small and the nucleus is big and they, they, they try to pull it forcefully, the iris at the section also will come out with the nucleus because, uh, because of the, uh, some vectis will rub on the iris there and and also, if you try to pull it from the small section, there also iris will come out. The, the most, uh, I mean, uh, the most common reason for this iris to come out is one is, you know, the intraoperative meiosis, wherein the iris goes beyond the inner lip. And we, if we inject too much of visco behind the nucleus, some of uh, the visco will go behind the iris. When you try to press the posterior lip to pass the vectis under the nucleus, the iris tries to prolapse through the tunnel. 
the visco tries to come out and it pushes the iris uh, into the tunnel so one of the simple way to do is to make a small iridotomy there so that the visco only will come out and the iris will not follow rather iris not, will not get pushed yeah if i can add to what uh, dr sundar said is the uh, see the we all are uh, we, like in fecal emulsification we try to make the tunnel smaller and smaller and smaller but in sis we should not do it uh, there is no need to uh, you know make the tunnel smaller we can work with a larger tunnel imagine i keep telling this again if we are doing fecal emulsification if you have a large tunnel you can't maintain the chamber you cannot do anything it keeps leaking from that so it's small tunnels are absolutely essential now the, the the advantage of sics is you should have an adequate tunnel don't try to reduce to make the tunnel smaller that's my personal uh, you know request to everybody especially in the beginning of your career have a very comfort of very large tunnels if necessary you can even put one single stitch in the center but don't try to narrow it down and you know compromise the endothelium endothelium gets heavily compromised in narrow tunnels and uh, whenever there is an, if you suspect ifis ifis uh, you know or when the when the uh, at dr sundaram shetty said when the pupils are smaller try to make the corner shelf little longer if you keep the corner shelf very very small then there will be a tendency for the iris to collapse iris collapse is not good at all it should not happen because that iris permanently becomes weaker not only that and throughout the surgery it keeps stumbling throughout the surgery it keeps coming back coming out once it comes it's the fibers the the uh, mesenchyme is always weaker and it keeps coming out so you have to be very cautious and that's the time we can when 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 uh, you have to keep on using viscoelastics to form the chamber and push the iris backwards before i think closing down just a small uh, thing uh, it's irony that you know we don't use a good quality viscoelastics in sics if we can use sodium alernate or chondritin sulfate combination you know you can see so many corneas and the young surgeons are the one who require these not the experienced surgeons okay and unfortunate that we neither uh, have a paid a thought of it or you know we can afford it uh, we can, it, the indian companies are coming out with a good sodium hyaluronate solution and they're very inexpensive they don't cost much 300 or 500 at all until the surgeon gets a hang of handling the instruments how to introduce he doesn't have no have the idea of introducing the vectus inside that's the reason he'll be pushing the nucleus he, until he gets he want to we want to have a situation in the chamber where it doesn't lose so easily and using good viscoelastics is the simplest way to save so many endotheliums and that is one tip which we, we don't share you uh, once you develop skill you don't require any of those things until we do that we require all these things and these are the one which are going to save lot of endotheliums and we should be stressing on using them at least where uh, institutions who have run training center who can afford they can use it no problem they are not expensive at all they are not expensive at all nowadays and this is the simplest tip which everybody should have is you know it is accessible now it was expensive when we were starting heron used to cost some 5000 rupees now indian versions are costing 300 rupees and they do do similar job and you can see you can if you can nothing is more precious than endothelium so i don't think there is any debate for not using them and make it simpler for everybody else okay once they get the handle once they get the hang of handling the instruments everything will be easier i think that this is the biggest lesson or tip we should share with everybody let later on we teach them how to introduce the vectus and all those things before they learn how to introduce the vectus the ac is collapsing so they get so frustrated uh, until then you know these uh, tools are there which we need to use them we don't use them at all and let us not uh, let us forget that sics is an economical surgery it's a poor man surgery it is bullshit everybody's eye every I eye surgery is premium i totally agree with that every eye surgery is premium whether it's sics or feco i am not telling that you know uh, it's is equally precious whether you're doing a surgery for 1000 rupees or 1 lakh rupees you are charging that i is precious even yeah, for when we were learning surgeries they used to not even give us the pss in one small extra yeah no see no when we were learning we are so challenging we allowed to use the 25 ml ml of pss yeah. so the challenge used to be there we use only uh, one cc uh, one uh, vial of fisco for five patients and all those things and we they, should they go beyond that era. 
I don't yeah, think they'll agree with you. The the endothelium, as Sir keeps on telling, what is priceless is coral endothelium. So there is definitely you need to master your skills. There's no doubt about it. Until we get the hang of handling your instruments, understand the tissue respect which you have to give. These are some of the tools which are available everywhere. We don't tell them. You know, this is what you encouraged. They're not expensive now. Nobody. Yes, definitely, is, the question of price does not come when you're dealing with human eyes here. Uh, Doctor uh, Deepak, can you give us uh, some tips as to, like, uh, you know, there is contracting, contracting uh, combinations and hydrogen. And yes, sir. This book. Can you just yes. give a few tips here at what stage you use which, uh, which is the best uh, visco? Uh, for most cases, sir, we want space creation. You want the nucleus to be floating freely in the entry chamber, which is away from the endothelium, it's away from the iris as well, so that your instrumentation is easy. For this, best would be simple uh, chondrite sulfate 1.4%. The upper summit makes cohevisc, it's available at 350 rupees. Okay, you can just use that. But in severely compromised corneas and very dense cataracts, uh, where you are both the variables are there, endothelium is not healthy, dealing with extremely bulky cataract, you can use both. You can use a combination of chondritin sulfate, uh, the viscote like substance, which again Indian versions are available, in combination with just your HPMC and other things. Rexis and all you do with your HPMC, the needle, because Rexis ne needle uh, works only with HPMC. If you want to use uh, these other things, then forceps is best. But for rexis, you stick to your HPMC, do it with a needle. When you're managing the nucleus out, when you're trying to rotate the nucleus out and then put it in the antechamber, then introduce the two instruments, that is the time we would want you to use chondritin, the uh, cohevisc or sodium hyaluronate. Uh, in the cohevisc or the sodium hyaluronate is less expensive than the combination ones. The combination ones cost around 1000 rupees. This costs around three, 400 rupees. You can use both if the coronal endothelium is very compromised and then see. All learning curves can be the the uh, can be less step, uh, steepened if you use uh, better viscoelastics. That is my uh, two cents here. And you also mentioned about reuse of viscoelastics. Would you use it now or it's, it's never? Which one, sir? Which one, sir? Is viscoelastic to be reused? Uh, no, no, sir. Now we don't <laughs> reuse. <laughs> What, what we do is leftover viscoelastic, uh, we give to the patients, uh, you know, we add to the drops, like any drops the patient uses, we add to that and, you know, his viscoelastic goes to, in the, in, the, in the form of, we just mix it up and give it to the patient. So that's what protein, instead of, we, we don't throw it out, you'll feel bad to throw it out, but just mix it to the post-operative drops he is going to use, it gets diluted slightly, it doesn't matter, but then you just, you should give to the patient. Yes. So it lacked as post-operative lubricants to the yeah. eye. Any other questions? Anybody, any one of you can unmute and ask questions if you have any. Otherwise, we'll wind up for today. And uh... Deepak, I want to ask this, um, the elastic ones, viscoelastic, when it is in the anterior chamber, uh, how do you find uh, the the passing of the instrument through that. I always got a feeling that uh, the instrument is pushing this um, visco rather than it is going through it. As against HPMC. Yes, sir. No, no, sir. It, it is not much of a difference at all. Absolutely no difference. It won't uh, uh, do anything. Particularly while putting an IOL, if it was, uh, if it is not HPMC, if it is, uh, let's say, um, sodium hyaluronate. Uh, sodium hyaluronate. Yes, I, you know, tend to get a feeling that it is not passing through this so easily as against yeah, yeah. HPMC. Yeah, yeah, definitely, sir. There is little bit of you know the feel is slightly different, uh, but the mm -hmm. chamber maintenance is uh, exemplarily good there. That is what yeah. is in, uh, it, that is uh, rock solid. Yeah. yeah yes, is this screen visible by any chance? Yeah. Yes, yes sir. sir. It's visible. Fine. So these are the uh, two which I finalized. And uh, this is the uh, uh, wire vector that I was talking about. It's made of a very thin wire. It's less than 26 gauge wire. And this is a temporary one, model one. The, the length is very short. The width is larger than the width here. So the nucleus, the heminucleus does not herniate and go backwards. So this is working extremely well. This now is made into a metal now. The other end of it will have a wire vector like this, which is really beautiful. It's, 
it's, it's useful for everybody. Anything that you would like to remove from the anterior chamber, it's, you're seeing the flat on, but on the side, it has got a, a cup-like uh, uh, feature. And uh, this also, the, now I've asked him to combine uh, this, this is not going to be as long as this, but it's going to be much shorter instrument like a needle holder. And normally, this uh, you know, wire vectors are very long. So, uh, all the measurements of all the instruments need to be changed uh, you know, to give a uh, good grip on the eye. Micros, the long ones are meant for the surgeries which we used to do in the past. Now, all instruments should be about three inches or four inches, and this should be accommodated within four inches. And uh, you know that should be available soon. So the combination of them has worked very well in my hands. Okay, sir. Anything I think uh, it should be time, Dr. Preeti. You can wind up. It was a very interesting session tonight. But I'll go back and try the bisection again. As postgraduate safe surgery is more important than uh, having a good astigmat control on astigmatism and also don't. My professor used to say everything big like conjunctiva big, conjunctival excision big, wound big, rexis big. So you have a more safer surgery than uh, more refractive surgery. That is what is the take home message for today. Be safe. Have a safe surgery. Save the endothelium. Yeah, and save the endothelium. Contract in sulfate. So, <laughs> the guys making are very happy with Deepak today. Pardon me? One thing is, graduates can buy their own uh, stuff rather than because yes, sir, PCS exactly. hardly gives pays any money to buy anything. So, they can buy their own. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it is like, uh, what is that? Bringing all your stethoscope and measuring tape, etc. Like that, you bring your uh, contract in sulfate to the OT. <laughs> so we used to buy our own blades at some point of time because like... No, actually, that's a good point. You should buy your own blades. You should get used to the sharpness of blade because the, the yes. brand changes, your everything changes actually. <laughs> so. uh, Dr. Deepak, you never had any tasks or something like that in the Indian brands? Yeah, yeah, we do have occasionally. That is always there. You have with even with viscoelastic also we have visco the HPMC also we have, which everything we have. So that's a, that's a nightmare which is ever continuing. It's never going to end, you know. So that's, a, that's a, especially with Indian bands. So yeah, so that is true. It's yeah. really it's there. It's always there. Actually, Dr. Deepak, if I can add something. Uh, in our hospital, all the syringes and the disposable blades are ET ward. Even if they are freshly packed, and okay. viscoelastics, drypan blow, and we autoclave them and we use it. We don't have any problem at all. After that uh, bad episode, what we had last year, okay. uh, we are we are doing this, and we have switched totally to BSS right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, better to be safe, you know, rather than sorry. And uh, regarding this, asking the postgraduates to buy, you know, we'll not have control on what comes into the OT. I don't okay. think that is advisable. Okay. Yeah, because you are answerable. Ultimately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the best would be uh, to uh, not to use, even if it comes in a sterile pack, in, in our hospital, we don't use anything, uh, even if it comes sterile to us, we don't use. And a lot of people give viscoelastic samples, they will go into the drops. We ne they never come to the operation theater. Have faith in one brand and we keep buying them. Always buy in boxes. Like if viscoelastic comes in a box of 400, you buy 400. So don't buy it uh, loose. In our hospital, we never prescribe anything, not even syringes, visco, medicines, nothing. We buy it ourselves, store it in a very uh, clean uh, you know, uh, uh, environment, and then we use anything that goes to the OT has to be purchased by us from the main vendor. Don't, don't buy it from the shops which are available. I think Nagarajan said that in ample number of words. And uh, even Visco, uh, we autoclave it. Uh, we buy, even now I buy bottles and it has to go through the autoclaving. Then uh, we don't see TARS at all. I don't think we have seen TARS for never. I don't remember. But TARS is something which is totally preventable. Uh, uh, so the, the only way is uh, uh, just because it's sterile pack, 
there can be micro cracks in it and uh, you get anything from including cartridges cartridges which we use for the surgery it comes in loose cartridge and he would have put a rubber band around a cover you know he puts a rubber band if you put a rubber band there will be micro cracks and it would have you know unster it, it probably the inside will be unsterilized so no sterile pack should be covered in rubber band any number of times i tell the suppliers they put a rubber band on five of them and they give it to you uh, and uh, anything that comes to your hospital inspect the box okay to avoid the tars as well as the infection inspect the box as it comes out it should be absolutely perfect sometimes you would have sent in other hospital other hospital would have opened it they are not used they return it to the stockist and he sends it to us the seal has to be intact so these uh, small small things uh, of housekeeping that you follow uh, it will be it will be much safer for you and uh, nothing in the new instruments anything everything has to go through the autoclave except the bss we don't autoclave except that everything goes through this sterilization process so the cartridge part and all how do you manage the i will cartridges cartridge, do you... i i insist them to give it in a box it comes in a box of 10 or 5 okay, yeah usually they come in box and uh, so see the box is already i'll take it inside directly but if it comes it's like you buy one lens they give yeah if you cartridge. buy one lens they'll give one cartridge oh no, that will not go into my setup it has to go through autoclave autoclave slightly changes the configuration of the uh, you know yeah that's good cartridge right. It shrinks it. Yeah, so yeah. I have that uh, slit technique, but now we do it. The set kept separately. We do sterilize in our own direct pouch, and then we use it separately. Cartridge. Now, this how does uh, the autoclaving uh, helps uh, prevent TAS? Oh, that's <laughs> autoclaving will not prevent TAS. Uh, cleaning processes will prevent TAS. That's what they you know. You mentioned uh, because of the auto cleaning, you didn't have any no, infection problem. Infection, infection, sterility infection. issues. Yeah, the you know the end of cell marriage will be prevented by auto cleaning everything. Tars is something is, is a chemical or uh, dead bacteria or dead yeah. Obviously, uh, there is no contribution from the side of the surgeon. I think no. It is the quality of the uh, the substance that cleaning we process. use. Cleaning process. Your cleaning process. Cleaning process. Many times it's the chemicals we use to wash the instruments, uh, clean the instruments. If the residues are there, or it can be uh, the the any debris which is there in it can cause tars, the toxic reaction. Thank you. So good night, everyone. Good night, yeah. Good night, good night everybody. everyone. We'll 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 have interesting uh, discussions next time again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to everybody and have safe safe uh, stay